What's going on everybody? Welcome in. My name is Dr. Jim Cellini and I'm a board certified practicing veterinary neurologist and neurosurgeon. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about a paper that recently was published out of the University of No Shit that showed that pugs can no longer be considered a normal dog breed. The papers managed to generate a few headlines, so I thought I would go through the paper, what they did, the ramifications of their findings, and talk about pugs in general. This is a breed I haven't mentioned much on my channel, but I talked about brachycephaly all the time and how I'm against the creation of flat face breeds in general. So I figured this would be a good topic to talk about. Before I get started, please hit that like and subscribe button. Maybe leave a comment below if you liked what you hear and see today. All right, let's get into it. All right, so the uh, introduction or background of this paper is actually pretty interesting. It gave some factoids that I did not know. They mentioned how pugs are thought to represent an ancient dog morphology with the modern pug documented by Confucius as early as 551 BC, which is pretty crazy and that the name pug derives from the Latin term pugnus, which is Latin for fist. So like from the cross, sec cross side view, your fist looks like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of looks like a pug from the side, right? So, and they go on to talk about some things that are pretty alarming too, how the breed is so overrepresented to uh, brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, which I'll get to in a second, corneal ulcers, dystocia, meaning inability to give a normal birth and require surgery, C-section. Um, and they also mentioned the breed standard, which I always rail against with these flat face breeds, but the breed standard mentions how no pug should be lean and leggy and how obesity has been reported as the most common disorder of pugs and that pugs are the dog breed with the highest predisposition for obesity in the UK and how they're making the assumption that that's probably due to the breed standard forbidding being lean, which makes no sense, but let's get on with the paper. So basically the goal of this study was to compare a large number of dogs, pugs versus non-pugs, compare the two groups over the course of the year 2016 in the UK, and see if the pugs were overrepresented or underrepresented to certain diseases and conditions. They wanted to see what the pugs were at risk for and what the non-pugs were at risk for so that we could get a sense of how healthy this breed is uh, just in general as a whole. And they not only looked at individual diseases like a lot of previous papers have done, but they also lumped a bunch of diseases into broad categories. So say for instance, instead of looking at risk of uh, airway obstruction or pneumonia, they would lump all of that into respiratory disease and GI disease and cancer in general or spinal disease. So the paper grouped disorders as well, which is not something that's been looked at a lot before. So the study was able to go through over 900,000 dogs in the UK under veterinary care in the year 2016. And what they pulled from that large population was 4,300 pugs and 21,800 about non-pugs. So there's your two groups, 4,300 pugs, and 21,800 or so non-pugs. So of the pugs, again, there's 4,000 to be exact, 4,308 pugs, 3,164 of them, or 73%, were diagnosed with one or more disorder compared to, of the non-pugs, 14,408, or 66%. So again, 73% of pugs were diagnosed with at least one disorder, which I'll list in a second, and 66% of non-pugs were listed with one or more of these disorders. Right away, you start to see that pugs as a population are starting the trend towards having more problems or more likely to have certain problems compared to not being a pug. So it's not off to a good start for the pug breed, but let's keep going. So the paper pretty quickly gets into the results. Table two in this paper, which I'll show, put up on the screen right here, I think is the kind of take home message here. So if you look at the pug count versus non-pugs, and the odds ratio. Odds ratio can simply, in this paper, mean this. If the odds ratio is greater than one, it means pugs are increasingly, as you get greater than one, overrepresented for the specific problem compared to the other group. If the odds ratio dip below one, it becomes less likely that they're affected by that. So if you look at the odds ratio column, you go down and you see that the number one and getting below one doesn't happen until the very bottom. That means everything that you've looked at, pugs are overrepresented for. You can see huge overrepresentation for things like brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, which I've talked about in a previous video, stenotic nares, which is narrow nostrils, corneal ulcers, skin fold dermatitis, oral ear discharge, allergic skin disorders, demodex mange, obesity, 
uh, patellar luxations, that's when their kneecap flops around and doesn't stay stable. Kennel cough, conjunctivitis, vomiting, anal sac issues, all sorts of different things on this odds ratio table. Now to be fair, they're underrepresented for a couple things too, like say a heart murmur or you know, lipomas for instance. But then they also list like aggression, which is a behavioral problem, which pugs are underrepresented for. That's kind of just what pugs are. They're not very aggressive dogs, in case you didn't know. So there's some positive here, but I would say the majority of the, the major take home message of this table tells me that pugs are very overrepresented for all these different things. Now, if you wanna break down these diseases into groups, say calling every type of respiratory problem, just respiratory tract disorders, for instance, lumping all types of cancer into just cancer, you can see in table three, pugs follow a similar sort of rule. Their adjusted odds ratios are greater than one for the vast majority of these conditions. It doesn't get below one until you get the heart disease again, behavior disorders, traumatic injury, which I would argue pugs are not as susceptible to trauma because they can't run as well. They can't get hit by a car quite as easily as like a Labrador that can go sprinting out of your backyard. Separate issue. Uh, but yeah, you can see here, even by groups of diseases, not specific diseases, pugs are hugely you know, at risk for these sorts of things. So what this data is starting to show us is that, as they mentioned in the discussion, pugs are diverging away from other breeds. If you look at them individually, I'm sure other breeds do this too, like French Bulldogs. But pugs have diverged away from other breeds as a result of our selective breeding and trying to make them more and more like human features and flat face. And while yes, they did diverge away in a beneficial manner for say heart murmurs, like I mentioned from table two, the vast majority of these divergences result in a net negative or net harm to the breed because of all the conditions they're predisposed to. Now the paper goes on to talk about how similar to French Bulldogs, pugs have a number of conditions that they call ultra predispositions. This means that they are over four times uh, at risk, four times the risk compared to a dog that is not of that breed, Pugger French Bulldog, of developing certain conditions. They talked about a pretty remarkable finding that seven of the eight ultra predispositions in pugs are shared as ultra predispositions in French Bulldogs. Those things being BOAS or brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, stenotic nares, member of the narrow nostrils, corneal ulceration, skin fold dermatitis, ear discharge, allergic skin disorders, and demodex. But what's striking is that two completely separate breeds, pugs and French bulldogs, which share the fact that they're brachycephalic or flat faced, have almost identical lists of ultra predispositions when you separate them out and look at other breeds compared to them should tell you everything you need to know about how harmful it is to impart this really flat-faced appearance to dogs. Now in the discussion, the paper brings up BOAS, that's brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. Essentially that means that because they're flat-faced, air cannot get through their nose and into their lower airway, their, their lungs, uh, in a you know normal manner. There's too much turbulence and it's blocked and dogs aren't able to breathe normally. Obviously this is a huge welfare impact for any breed affected by that. But to be 52 times more likely to develop that condition if you compare a single breed to all other dogs is pretty striking. Like you don't get 52 times greater likelihood with many things. So that's pretty significant. But what the paper also gets into is the fact that the true incidence of BOAS and pugs may actually be much higher. The reason being they bring up signs that pugs and like you know bulldogs in general where they snore, they act air hungry, they have sleep apnea. You'll see bulldogs all the time kind of like sleeping, standing up almost, or like having their head propped up against something. People think that's cute, but actually it's just signs of sleep apnea that they're having. And oftentimes these signs don't get counted as signs of brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. And they make the argument, or at least the mention, that you probably should mention these sorts of problems and include them um, for criteria for BOAS. Because as somebody who suffers from severe sleep apnea myself, it is absolute hell. And without my CPAP, I would not be able to function as a normal human being. And I know this because people tell me I look tired all the time. So yeah, I would encourage you to read this study if you got some free time and you wanna learn about the issues facing pug. In general, my stance in regards to pugs and any flat-faced or brachycephalic breed 
is that we should not be creating animals with these conformations. We should be actively outcrossing away from this because making them this way is so unhealthy and it creates a ton of animal suffering above and beyond what the general populace is currently aware of. So I think we should completely do away with brachycephaly as a feature in every animal, full stop. All right guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Please smash that like and subscribe button. Leave a comment below. Let me know if you agree or disagree and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for stopping by. Have a good one.